I've been cautioned against reading all three of these bios, so let me just say that uh, we're going to get uh, three speakers, Kyle Lamb, Michael Masson, or Masson, uh, and Susan Coulter, all three from Lawrence, no, from Los Alamos National Laboratory. Thank you. Right this way. All right, so um, I'll start off since we didn't do a full bio. Um, my name is Kyle Lamb, and I am uh, the infrastructure team lead, so I'm in charge of storage at Los Alamos from the production sense. Um, Mike Mason, who will be following me, is actually in charge of works on storage and also um, is the technical lead for our um, monitoring projects. And then Susan Coulter is actually uh, the technical lead for our networking. So. All right, the overview of what we're going to go over, we've got some background of uh, Lustre at Lanel, um, current Lustre status, uh, future deployments, and then some fine grain routing. And I'm going over the first two of those, the background and the current Lustre status, um, and I'm going to rush through those so that we have more time for the fun stuff, which is the um, second two sections. So background, um, Los Alamos was actually a primarily a Panassas shop for many years, um, including the years that I started there. And so starting out, um, I learned Panassas, of course. Um, Luster came into play whenever we brought Cielo in, and um, it's actually taking um, pr predominance at Los Alamos as well. Um, we're actually deploying a quite a bit of Luster these days. Um, I don't know if the mic is doing funny things over there, so I'll step over this way. Um, and as we go forward, we actually have um, a quite a few, or a quite a bit of growing pains that we had to go through. Um, some of the things that we took for granted that we were using with Panassas actually had to change. Purging, um, since we had multiple metadata servers with Panassas, uh, we were able to have a very different purge policy and we were able to walk the tree much more expediently than we were able to with Lustre. Whenever we first tried to run our same purge code on Lustre, uh, we crashed the system pretty well. Um, and then uh, user load balancing, same, same issues. Um, and then the monitoring, we did have to write up quite a bit of um, different monitoring applications to monitor Luster versus Panassas. And I just stopped the show. There we go. Good. The idiot proofed it. All right. Um, so our first deployment was this yellow Luster deployment. Um, it's a, still running with 1.8. Um, my quote up there about if it ain't broke um, kind of applies. Um, it also is just a lot of work for us to go in and reformat and go to a newer version for a system that um, we were told had a shorter life, lifetime. Um, it's looking like it might advance out a little bit further. Uh, it consists of three different file systems, two of them that are two petabyte file systems and one four petabyte file systems, aggregate of about 160 gigabytes per second across all three, um, a fat, t fat tree topology for the IB, and it is only used by Cielo. Um, we have our first Lustre file system that we brought in. This was a vendor-provided Lustre file system. It was a DDN stack with um, their software and their OS. And so this was kind of us um, breaking our um, teeth into the Lustre community and, and starting to get um, really organized around Lustre. We took on a couple of things with this system. One of them was that we started our fine-grained routing solution with this system. Um, and um, I can't think of the other one that we took on. Um, we uh, had it as a three petabyte file system in aggregate, and we were able to attain about 35 gigabytes of, per second from our systems that were direct connected via IB. Uh, our second Lustre file system that we brought in was L2. This was a very small Lustre file system, only a petabyte in aggregate. Um, we actually undertook with this system a quite a few different things. One was we wanted it to be a diskless boot system. Um, so uh, it's diskless and it's also running the TriLab operating system, TOS stack. Um, and we are running Lustre version 253 on this system. Uh, we went and undertook the um, uh, change to go ahead and run it with ZFS on our OSTs as well. Um, it's still LDISCFS on the MDT because of the performance that we were able to see on ZFS on our MDT. Um, and one of the other big things that we did with this system was look at how can we grow a system over time. So when we brought this, in, this system in, we actually tested out adding more OSTs to it and doing that type of work so that in another few months we're looking at doubling the size of this. Um, our current, we do have um, uh, compression on on this system as well, and we're currently seeing about a compression ratio of 1.5x. 
So, now to the fun stuff. Mike? Thank you. So it's not quite fun yet, but I'll rush through mine so Susan can talk about her fun stuff. Uh, so as Kyle told you, uh, right now in the open, we have about four petabytes of luster. In the secure, we have about eight petabytes of luster. That's what we have today. By the end of this year, we're going to increase that by 10 times. So uh, by December of this year, the open will have about 15 petabytes. The uh, secure will have over 100 petabytes of luster. Uh, so how are we going to do that? So currently, Kyle told you we have L, uh, L1 and L2. Uh, L2 will be at least doubled uh, by next year. And Panassas makes up the rest of our storage there. Uh, so we're getting rid of Panassas by early 16. So to augment that, we released an RFP for our, our third open luster file system. Uh, that was released in March, uh, March 9th. Uh, and actually today we get the responses for that RFP. So pretty soon we'll have a vendor and start getting that in. Uh, we just had a few minimum requirements. So we're, we had a minimum requirement of about five petabytes. That will likely be about 10 petabytes with our budget for that. Uh, and then uh, our only real technical requirement was uh, bandwidth of about 80 to 100 gigabytes per second. Uh, if you want to talk offline with me about our decision to put very few mandatory requirements and a lot more sort of target requirements that was to get around our uh, procurement office which being a government lab we have a, a lot of restrictions on what we can buy so we did some tricks to make things a little easier on us. So Susan's going to give you a more detailed overview here but here's a quick cartoon of our open luster infrastructure. Everything starts with our, our, our IB infrastructure in the middle there all of our Lustre file systems, all the servers connect up to that IB infrastructure. The level above that is our LNET routers. So over there we have 32 LNET routers that all our Ethernet connected uh, clusters go through to connect to all systems including our new L3 system which will be deployed sometime starting in the summer. Uh, all new clusters, their I.O. nodes will play sort of double duty. It will be the normal I.O. node with LNET running as well. Uh, and all new clusters will have that. Uh, our secure environment, so like Kyle said, our only luster is connected to Cielo. Everything else is Panassas. Again, that's going away early 16. Uh, so we're piggybacking on top of that L3 RFP to buy two new secure luster file systems. Uh, hopefully we'll have the, now have the same type of luster file system in both the open and secure to consolidate the type of file systems. Right now we have pretty much all of our file systems are unique. Uh, and again, that will be in those, both uh, new red file systems will be in production by December. Uh, that means we're building, testing, and debugging three file systems within three months. And we only have a few people to do that, so we're gonna be very busy the next few months or so. But those red file systems I was talking about are only about 20 petabytes. The rest of that 100 petabytes comes with our new uh, supercomputer, Trinity. So most of that, uh, most of the supercomputer itself will be here in the summer. Uh, all of the file system will be here. Uh, Trinity itself has about two petabytes of main me memory. It uh, has an integrated burst buffer with uh, almost four petabytes, running at about 3.3 uh, terabytes per second. Trinity will have over 200 LNET routers to connect it to its file system. So just like Cielo, it will have its own file system. Uh, though it will actually have two file systems uh, made from Cray, Synexion 2000s. Uh, each file system will be 39 petabytes each. That gives us uh, 78 petabytes of total uh, usable space, uh, running at about 1.3 terabytes per second. So that's scaled to dump 80% of main memory in 20 minutes. Uh, the file system itself is 19 racks each, that's 38 total racks, uh, made up of 108 SSUs per file system. Each SSU has two OSSs, so that's 216 OSSs, each controlling one OST. The OSTs are six terabyte drives, or sorry, 41 drives made up of six terabyte drives uh, in a grid RAID. Uh, we'll be running Lustre 2.7 and some type of, of DNE over uh, our five metadata servers. 
Uh, I'll skip these details, but so Trinity itself will be here in the summer. We already have two test systems, Trinitite and Gadget, uh, with their own burst buffer, with their own uh, Synexion file systems. Uh, if you want to know some more about uh, those file systems and what we're expecting for Trinity, we have two posters uh, right behind you. So right now, let me turn it over to Susan for fine grain routing. I don't know how to work this thing. Uh, just the buttons right All there. Right. <laughs> okay, um, so I am not a file systems person. I'm a networking person, but I'm learning Lustre a little bit. Um, I'm fond of saying I never used to be able to spell Lester, and I am learning a little bit. Um, but when we did bring in, in the fall of 2013, when we were bringing in L1, um, we had some design decisions to make, and one of those was about fine grain routing. Um, and so I'm going to assume that you guys understand what fine grain routing is, but I'll talk about it a little bit here and then in more detail in another slide. Um, basically, we heard about fine grain routing. I have some acknowledgments and... Uh, some acknowledgments and uh, references here. Um, I believe that as far as the literature that I could find, the first reference of this was um, in a presentation in 2011 for CUG, which was mostly based on Jaguar, but there was at the end of it, there was a conversation about um, isolating the high bandwidth traffic between LNET routers and OSSs to, uh, in that case, they were actually getting better performance. But that's kind of the first uh, uh, instance of it that I could find. We first heard about it when we were purchasing L1 and we had the Cray folks come and give us a presentation on their Synexian product and uh, they talked about fine grain routing. So basically fine grain routing is a way of compartmentalizing your high bandwidth traffic um, and, and keeping it on a leaf switch which basically reduces the amount of hardware switches and cables that you need um, to deploy a system. So we had to decide if we were going to use fine grain routing or not. And these are some of the criteria that we had. Um, one of the things that, so the final configuration was going to be three Lustre file systems, which we're getting very close to that now with L3 RFP out. Um, we assumed three IB connected clusters um, as a uh, Kyle and Mike both mentioned we're basically an Ethernet shop now. So, um, but our first IB connected cluster came in early 2014, and the next couple that we get will be IB connected as well as we transition over to Lustre. Um, and then we wanted to have a close impedance match between the number of hosts and then the number of links that would be needed between the various layers uh, in the IB fabric. And you'll have to for forgive me here for using the term impedance. My husband is a physicist and we had a very long conversation one night about impedance and inductance and capacitance and pointing vectors. <laughs> so yes, this is a simplified analogy here, but <laughs> I think you understand my meaning. We don't want a full. Fa we would have to have a full fat tree in order to ensure that that we didn't have congestion and and um, bad points like that in the fabric. Um, we wanted to think about the hardware requirements, what it would take to um, to actually deploy. Um, we wanted to be able to expand because we knew that we were going to be expanding and we needed that to be easy and, and somewhat um, transparent. Um, and then there was the support model. So some of the other people that are mentioned here on this slide are from DDN, Steve Valimaki and Oz Rentas. Um, when we bought this DDN system, as Kyle mentioned, or maybe it was Mike, um, it was a DDN uh, solution, so it used Exascaler, it used their software, and, and we turned around and basically fundamentally changed the underlying networking. Um, and that was a, a, a bone of contention of sorts. It was really hard to get um, technical support because I would have to explain over and over again why we were doing this. They thought we were insane. So DDN worked with us really well and they got us hooked up with Oz Rentas who is a, I don't know, level two or three or something um, support guy and he understood what we were doing and so when we had problems in the future we were able to, to go directly to him. So without going through all the painful steps, basically without fine grain routing, um, when we got the DDN system we had six switches. Um, and so these six switches here, we, it was set up as two spines and four leafs. Um, and so as we stepped through, what would it take if we added another Lustre file system, another compute cluster, you know, how much more, tra how much more um, hardware would we need? And this is what it ended up looking like. It was pretty ugly. It, um, we basically would need twice as many switches and therefore about twice as many cables. With fine grain routing, it looks like this. Um, so as you can see, there, there's pros and cons here. Um, the pros are that it's basically simpler. Um, you basically, um, 
it, it's lower hardware costs. Uh, we knew it would be translatable to the red because we were going to be deploying Lustre file systems in the red probably at larger scale. So we needed to uh, experiment with this and see if it works so that we could use it in the red and therefore save even more money there because it was going to be a larger system. And like I said, we wanted to be able to expand it without a lot of work. Um, the cons, um, so FGR was relatively new. Um, even within the Lustre community. DDN had not used it, um, but they, were, they understood its benefits, and so they were willing to help us out, partly so that they could understand it and maybe deploy it and therefore support it on other um, systems. Um, LANL itself was very new to Lustre. We, we, weren't, we didn't have a, a lot of depth in our knowledge, so it was a little risky to do this. Um, as I said, the support, and then um, it, it does make for a more complex LNET uh, a mod probe, I should say mod probe, uh, Lustre config file on the client can be a little more complex with this setup. Um, so basically, this is what this is how we did, we, we went with FGR, and this is what L1's core looks like. Um, and basically, what you have here is the basic file system. Um, what I consider the file system, OSSs and MDSs, all reside on one O2IB network, which is basically O2IB zero. Which, if you don't use FGR, is about all you got. Um, then what we did was we created another O2IB network over here. Um, these LNET routers are the 32 LNET routers that were mentioned that were Ethernet connected. Um, they are in their own O2IB network along with the same MDSs. So the MDSs are in two O2IB networks. <coughs> um, and then the important ones are these that, that are going horizontally, these leaf switches. We broke up the LNETs and the OSSs into, into four pieces. And so the only OSSs that this, these LNETs ever speak to are these OSSs. So all of that high bandwidth communication is isolated on the leaf switch, which allows us to have really skinny uplinks um, to, the, to the spine. Um, on the expansion side of things, I added, um, I also added our couple of cluster stuff, cluster bits here, but um, we added L2. And we basically duplicated the same concept. We're using the same set of leaf switches. So this, these, this is the, the switches aren't shown here because it kind of made the drawing ugly. But this is the same leaf switch. We added OSSs to each leaf switch. Um, the MDSs again are in the file system uh, O2IB net. They're in the LNET O2IB net. And we were able to add, bring L2 up on this same fabric with, with no notice to the L1 users. So it, the, the transition was very, very smooth. And then the only thing to, else to call out here is, is the Wolf cluster is, like I said, our first um, native IB cluster. And it has its own set of LNET routers or IO nodes. These guys actually dual purpose. They have an IB card that goes into the Luster uh, fabric and they have an Ethernet card that goes to campus so they can get to Panassas because we still do use Panassas in production. This is what it's going to look like in the future. This is very similar to the one that Mike showed. Um, so we have L1, L2, L3 is coming this year. Um, we have future clusters coming that I believe that's next year. Um, and so and this just shows we did we do have uh, switch ackles in place to protect and that was done for security reasons. Um, but so this is what it's going to look like in the future. And, and we believe that by going with fine grain routing, we're going to be able to do that without much, um, without having to upgrade or add switches, we hope. One of the things we're, we're hoping to be able to do is those 32 LNET routers, that's a lot of LNET routers, and we're going to try and test if we can remove a couple and not affect the performance, because um, we think we're restricted by the I.O. nodes, not the LNET routers. Um, that could free up some ports. And also as our uh, legacy Ethernet clusters go away, um, we may be able to remove some of those LNETs. So the last bit is, um, so this is what we think we're going to do in the secure. It's basically a modified fat tree. People call it a dragonfly. We're calling it a damselfly just to be different. Damselfly is a real insect, very similar to a dragonfly. It's a picture of one right there. Um, and so basically, we did come in, we did find some problems with fine grain routing. Um, there's a limitation on your IP routes um, configuration in your, in your mod probe config. There's a limit of 256 characters. And we were um, doing failover on our, um, for the LNETs, we were doing routes, failover routes that basically mapped 
with the OST failovers. So if you lost an OSS and your OST w f failed over to another OSS, that was the same mapping we used for LNET failover. Um, but that made for a very long uh, IP routing uh, configuration uh, string. And we found that uh, we maxed it out at 256. So there's a couple different solutions. We talked about, you know, well, it's open source. Let's find the source and see if we can fix that. Um, we didn't really have time for that uh, when we discovered the, the situation. So we basically simplified and collapsed the, um, the failover routing. Um, we're going to have to come up with a better solution, a more elegant solution, I believe, for L3. Um, we also would like to experiment, and I hope to pick some brains in the room about um, using the same five O2IB networks um, for all our file systems and just using the mod probe config to, to define by IP address who is who. We were afraid that there'd be some overlap and some confusion if we, if, we, if we use those same networks with L2, so we went with different ones. So those are all questions that we may, you know, we may wind up doing things differently. Um, as we move forward. But it's been a really good learning experience. We've all learned a lot. Kyle's team has really come up to speed on Lustre and then converting it to the TOS stack and ZFS and everything. It's, it's been great. And this is where we're going in the future. Panassas is going away. So um, we're now part of the Lustre community. So I believe that's it. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions. Yes? We are using, well, on D, on the, and you guys can tell me, tell me if I'm wrong. On L1, we're using 2.5, which is CentOS, DDN provided. Um, on L2, I believe we're using 2.5 as well. Yes. 2.7, Right, I saw that. Yay, I saw that earlier, and I was like, that's what we need. So that's very cool, yeah. Because there was an L control command, but it said it was deprecated where you could add routes afterwards or something. But I didn't want to go down that route because the man page or somewhere said it was deprecated. So, <coughs> Any other questions? I don't have my laptop with me. I can't check. I think in 2.5 it may not be documented, but you can specify IP to nets and routes via files. Aha, uh -huh. so, so instead the, so of in can, the actual modprobe.conf, yeah. you can so point you to a file. You, you set IP to nets to a path name, you set routes to a path name, you load that, okay. as your current, and then the kernel will load, load the, the data from those files and okay. get around the barrier that way. So it sounds like there's a couple of solutions that we can, that we can use. Is that, is that solution 4K page a limit? Well, 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 I'm not sure about that. Okay. So out of curiosity, how many people in the room are familiar with fine grain routing and or use it? Cool. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you.